lesbian means to you? Well, it means um, two women making love to each other. Yeah, two, yeah. yeah. You agree? Oh, yes. Yeah. 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 yeah, definitely. Yeah. Okay. Oh, God. <laughs> um, Immediate response. Well, a female homosexual, I mean, that's... And what would that, that entail? Well, nothing much. I mean, it's just the sign of the times, isn't it? I don't, it doesn't mean anything to me. My understanding of the word lesbian means... Uh, I mean, two ladies uh, in love with each other sexually. It's uh, somebody. It's, 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 um, it's a woman. It's doing an unnatural, um, an unnatural sexual act. With or is it with another woman? Well, it's homosex, isn't it? Like um, homosex. Uh -huh. Yeah. Men, women. Uh, oh, men mostly. Yeah. And and, and women. Uh -huh. Mostly women. And what and, and what about the word lesbian particularly? Oh, that means... I don't know so much about those, you know. Can you tell me what the word lesbian means to you? Yeah, when two women uh, get hold of each other, isn't it? What, you mean like, like wrestling, grappling, or...? No, they... <laughs> <laughs> no, they love each other, two women. OK. Yeah. What, just spending time with each, with each other, or...? No, sex, have sex with each other and... OK, all right, praise yeah, the Lord. You know. That's all right, fine. <laughs> what, 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 what about your answer? What does that mean? What does the word mean to you? What's it mean to me? When, yeah. uh, when two women like to do it with each other. The current Oxford Dictionary defines a lesbian like this. A female homosexual, a woman characterised by sexual interest in other women. According to that definition, feeling sexually attracted to other women makes lesbians into a distinct species, a whole separate category of women. It probably comes as a surprise to many people to realise that that way of thinking of lesbians, as a breed apart, is comparatively recent. It's not very much more than a hundred years old. So today, in gay life, we'll be seeing how that attitude came into being, what its effects have been, and how some lesbians today are challenging it. Ellen, I wish I could live with you always. If we had a cottage and a competency of our own, I do think we might love until death without being dependent on any third person for happiness. That letter was written by a woman, the novelist Charlotte Bronte, to another woman, her close and lifelong friend Ellen Nussie, in 1836. Intense friendships between women were common in the 19th century. They had close physical relationships too, as reflected in these photographs taken by Clementina Lady Horwarden in the 1860s. Women held hands. They kissed and walked with arms around each other but no one thought it was sexual. That's because in the 19th century, decent women weren't thought capable of initiating sex. Sexual impulses were things only men felt. So a woman with a sexuality active enough to be interested in other women was thought to be a freakish rarity, with nothing in common with the women in these photographs. Sonia Rule, a lecturer at the Open University and a lesbian herself, has been studying attitudes to sexuality in the 19th century. Well, for one thing, I think that seeing everything in sexual terms is rather a modern kind of way of looking at everything, and that just wasn't... Sexuality just didn't permeate life to such an extent um, at that time as it does now. It might be possible that sexual behaviour would take place between women, and that certainly was something that the church, um, some theologians, had noted as a possibility, but it wasn't anything that people were very interested in. It was a kind of... Um, area of sexuality that fell outside legal marital sex and interest was really very much focused on legal marital sex so if you broke the rules of that for example if you were a woman and you pretended to get married as a man that would focus attention on you all right um, but if you didn't do anything like that then this was a kind of activity that fell into an undifferentiated kind of category outside of marriage in which nobody was very interested nobody was interested to pin down and categorise all those different kinds of behaviour that weren't procreative sex within marriage. But already, 
By the mid-19th century, forces were at work that were to change these views. It's difficult for us now to appreciate the turmoil that the Industrial Revolution caused from the end of the 18th century. But within a few decades, the new machines had overturned almost everything that had given stability to people's lives in the past. People had lived on the land. Now they lived in sprawling cities. They had had space. Now they were crowded together. Their lives had moved with the seasons. Now they were regulated by machines. Their family life had been built around farming and had to be rebuilt around the demands of the factory. Most of the 19th century was spent trying to make some order out of this chaos. And where previous ages might have turned to the Bible for the answers, the 19th century turned to science. Scientists like Darwin had already used the techniques of meticulous observation, labeling and classification to make sense of the animal kingdom. Now, scientists used these same techniques on people. This scientific approach was to yield a completely new view of human behavior. Instead of seeing people as all equally capable of doing right or wrong, scientists thought that certain people were born physically and mentally different from the rest. These different types of people had no choice but to break society's rules. This applied to people who broke the sexual norms as well. A whole new breed of scientists called sexologists grew up to study them. Foremost among them were Richard Kraft Ebing, Havelock Ellis, and Sigmund Freud himself. Sexologists gave the name invert to people who were attracted to their own sex. They studied the rare example of such women as if they were a different species of human being. The sexologists were interested in all sorts of things. They might investigate um, um, the larynxes of those inverted women that they'd come across. They might investigate the kind of tone of voice or the muscle tone or something like that. And one of them even had a rather kind of convoluted test of inversion, which consisted in the following. When the arms are extended, palms upward, the invert, he suggested, might not be able to bring the forearms together as almost every woman can. And they never actually succeeded in focusing on a set of symptoms that really were defining characteristics of, um, of what we now call lesbians. A lot of this sounds absolutely ludicrous and grotesque. What were sexologists actually basing the theories on? Well, no, I mean, they, they were um, picking out what were the most visible um, inverted women. They, they obviously, they were proceeding by a method of uh, accumulating case studies, which were rare, it was difficult to do. Um, but those case studies that they were able to label as inverted women obviously were the most um, visible ones, and they tended to be the most masculine. Kraft Ebing wrote that the way to spot lesbians was to look for women who wear their hair short and dislike attending balls, have a preference for intellectual talk, pursue science rather than art, and who smoke and drink. In other words, women who went in for male activities of any kind. For he reasoned, that since only men were supposed to be sexually active, a sexually active woman must be some kind of man. But of course, this left a problem. What about the women with whom these pseudo-men went to bed? Were they lesbians too? Yes. Well, they didn't notice this, um, of course. And it did cause problems for them. Now, Havelock Ellis, for example, um, had an idea that, that the true invert, as he called it, was a masculine woman uh, with an active sexuality. But, of course, two people with active sexualities couldn't really get it together. The other one would have to have a passive sexuality because he was working on a model that was rather like men and women, you know, having sex in order to have children. And therefore, this other person would have to have a passive sexuality. But in that case, could she really be a proper lesbian? Well, he got round this by kind of creating a separate, rather cloudy and confused category who was attracted, it was a set of women who were attracted to other women, all right, um, but it was the kind of the pick of women that the men would pass by. And he says things like, 
um, men are really more interested in beauty of face, whereas inverts are more interested in beauty of figure and things like that. Um, and he tries to create that kind of distinction. But the clinching argument for him is really that this is a feminine type of woman with a passive sexuality and all that, but not really robust enough to have children, so therefore not really ideally suited to heterosexual sex. Kraft Ebing thought this second group of women were not born, but perverted into their lesbianism. He warned against masturbation and said of lesbianism, This vice is of late quite the fashion. Owing to novels on the subject, and partly as a result of excessive work on sewing machines, the sleeping of female servants in the same bed, seduction in schools by depraved pupils, or seduction of daughters by perverse servants. Now, this vice, sophism, is met more frequently among ladies of the aristocracy and the prostitutes. One book, The Well of Loneliness, published in 1928, finally brought all these ideas about lesbians to the public consciousness. It was written by the lesbian author Radcliffe Hall. The book, telling the story of an inverted woman, Stephen Gordon, was tried for obscenity and banned. Radcliffe Hall herself epitomised in her dress and manner the typical invert described by the sexologists. And her short hair, her male dress, and above all her melancholy book, were to provide the model for the way in which future generations of lesbians were to see themselves. Just how deeply the existence of this new lesbian personality was to affect women who felt attracted by other women can be seen by looking at the lives of older lesbians. Sybil Morrison is 87. As a very young woman, she was a suffragette and a prominent peace campaigner in two world wars. She grew up in the early years of the century before there was a label, lesbian, to give to her feelings for other women. In her day, the emphasis for girls was on their marriage prospects and not their sexuality. Because when I was young, you know, it, uh, one was supposed to get married, and um, I seem to recall being engaged to be married, you know, egged on by my parents, who thought I ought to, and, um, well, I had to step out of it because I couldn't bear the thought of it. Mm. Um, so, of course, that caused a disturbance. You know, a broken engagement. <laughs> Shocking. I think everything's much easier for yeah. people today. Sex came into her life comparatively late, but she doesn't regret it because sexuality played so little part in the identities of her generation of women. So your first actual relationship with another woman didn't come oh, until when? No, not, not until I was much older. Um, I, I find it difficult to put a date. Mm. In your 30s, 40s? Later than that, perhaps? Well, um, if I could remember what date it was that I was in prison, it would help me. 1940. 40, was 1940, it? 1940, yes. 40, that's right. And yeah, well, I think probably it was, it was just before then. Yes, mm. when you were 47, 48. Yes, yes. Yes, so a long time to wait. A <laughs> long time to wait, yes. Radcliffe Hall's book was published too late for its heroine, Stephen Gordon, to affect the way Sybil saw herself. The, the person in the book who was... Uh, Stephen. Stephen. Um, was not the kind of lesbian that I knew. I've never wanted to dress like a man. I mean, I'm thankful now to be allowed to wear slacks because it's pleasant and comfortable. Mm. Mm. But um, I, I never wanted to have a collar and tie and, and look like a man. I don't think that's anything to do with lesbianism. But I think at the mm. time, when I was young, it was thought to be mm. that you wanted to be like a man. Mm. It is, it's only later on that you learn it's nothing whatever to do with it. Mm. <laughs> I yes, think yes. I've learned that it's nothing yes. whatever to do with it. Because her sexuality isn't central to her life, Sybil is somewhat puzzled by women who see their lesbianism as so important that they feel the need for a lesbian scene. You don't envy the whole range of clubs and meeting places? No, no, not at up. all, not at all. You didn't miss them? In your well, no, I, no, I've never been involved in that way, you see. Uh, I mean, you tell me, you probably know more than I do. Um, 
Is, is that the kind of thing that goes on now with lesbians? That they belong to a club and... Quite a lot, and you, you've got one of the oldest around the corner. Uh, the oh, the gateways, one, one of the oldest lesbian oh. clubs in Europe that's been going since... When what? you say around the corner, uh, do you mean in Cheney Walk? <laughs> well, not quite. Uh, Bramerton Street, sort of round several Oh, course. I know where that yes. is. Yes yes, 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 yes. Oh, there's a club there, is there? Mm. Mm. Yes, yes. No, I didn't, I didn't know. I didn't know about it. For Rosemary Manning, the impact of the label lesbian was to be much more dramatic. She is now 69, a successful novelist, an author of children's fiction, and retired headmistress. But she was just 16 and still at boarding school in 1928 when Radcliffe Hall's book was published. By this time, a sexual element was often suspected in close relationships between girls, and when discovered, it was severely punished. At school, which was an all boarding school, no day girls, uh, Things came to a crux when two children were discovered to be lesbians. They were found in bed and they were expelled. This led me slap up against two things. One was ignorance, my own ignorance, because I really still did not know what they were actually doing. Uh, the other thing was it brought me up against what I thought of as corruption. It was a kind of double think. I knew the head and the staff were doing the same thing, yet here they were having us prefects up and telling us what a filthy thing these children had done. They were expelling them at once for it, and we had got to check the disease, as it was described. Well, we didn't know what it was, so we couldn't do much checking. And then the worst thing was that I myself was then involved through one of the two girls saying to the head that she had discussed the will of loneliness with me. I was therefore in the situation of finding myself accused of influencing these children, which I hadn't done, uh, and I was, uh, I felt betrayed. As a result, Rosemary's growing awareness of her own attraction to women was surrounded by guilt. She did not come to terms with this until 30 years later, when she wrote a novel, The Chinese Garden based on her schoolgirl experiences. Like Sybil Morrison, Rosemary did not have a full sexual relationship until she was in her 40s. But because Rosemary's life has been so dominated by the question of her sexuality, she, unlike Sybil, feels her youth was seriously affected. It has had the effect on me of keeping me in hiding, of keeping me uh, being secretive, and not being able to speak, except to the very closest of my friends, about my sexual uh, proclivities. I certainly feel if I were younger now, if I were a young woman now, I should be a very different person. I, in fact, would put this very strongly and say that I look back on my much of my 20s and 30s and even my 40s as a very serious waste of my potential waste of my personality, because I was forced into uh, a false position. And this is very disagreeable. Begin, this is Gold Brother, Gold Papa, Gold, rejoining, request joining instructions. Begin, Gold Brother, Gold Papa, Gold, rejoining, request joining and landing instructions. Papa Gold, join for 2 1 right hand circuit, QFE 1004. Cynthia Reed works for a local authority and is a keen pilot in her spare time. She grew up in the 50s, some 20 years after Rosemary Manning. Her generation of lesbians were also influenced by the old ideas. But with them, we see the beginnings of a new way of looking at what it means to be a lesbian. One way in which Cynthia's generation suffered was from the stereotype the public had of the lesbian as some kind of pseudo man she knew that this wasn't how she felt. I've never thought of myself as male in any way. It's true that a lot of my interests uh, from a very early age, as, even as a toddler, were conventionally those that are associated with boys rather than girls. 
So if I say to someone that I'm interested in bird watching or photography, no one bats an eyelid. But if I add something like sea angling and flying, you can see the eyebrows doing a vertical takeoff. <laughs> And I think people do perhaps assume sometimes that I've deliberately chosen those sort of interests in order to be seen as male, but that's not the case. And I think it says a lot about the sort of conventions of activities that you're allowed by virtue of your sex. But Cynthia admits that many lesbians of her generation allowed their whole lifestyles to be influenced by the stereotypes of the Butch Dyke invert and the neurotic feminine pervert. In fact, she and her lover, Julie Switzer, used to take delight in sending up the stereotypes that other lesbians had readily adopted. It's true, they did. About 15 or 20 years ago, that was quite a common pattern, wasn't yeah. it? The, um, the sort of lesbian relationship where you had one very masculine and one very feminine woman was common. And uh, that was reflected not only in the way they dressed, it was reflected in things like the careers mm. they took up yeah. and the hobbies, their interests, and probably even in sexual attitudes to some extent, there was this you know, definite sort of role difference. Mm. Yes, I mean, Cindy and I used to go around in collar and tie because, you know, it was kind of the done thing. You had to identify yourself as being butch or being femme. And we used to kind of send up the whole thing by both going out in collars and ties. <laughs> it used to quite upset some people, I think. Yes. Well, it's a bit of a joke. <laughs> I mean, we don't do that nowadays. Most women of Julia's and Cynthia's generation no longer accept that their lesbianism determines their personalities nor do they accept that they are sick or perverted. But in one important respect, they are still influenced by the sexologist's view of the world. They accept the idea that people are divided from birth into different sexual types, the majority heterosexual and the minority homosexual. I have no idea why my sexuality should have turned out different from most other people. And I don't think there's any research to indicate the causes Certainly, people haven't found any difference, physiological or psychologically, between homosexuals and heterosexuals. But I'm not sure that it really matters what the causes are. And if I could draw an analogy, uh, when I was a child, my father was a cricketer, and at three I wanted to learn to play, be like Daddy. And he began to teach me, and although he was totally right-handed, it was immediately obvious that I was a natural left-handed bat and right-handed bowler. But no one did a lot of heart searching to think, why is this? Why is she different? Unfortunately, no one tried to change me. It just mattered that you had a good innings, made a respectable score and enjoyed the game. It didn't really matter that I held the bat the other way around. In some ways, this view has had a conservative influence. Julie and Cynthia never wanted to challenge the heterosexual world. They just wanted to fit in. At work, this approach has allowed them, like many lesbians of their generation, to build very successful careers and earn a comfortable lifestyle for themselves with enough money to support hobbies as varied as flying or beekeeping. You get the odd kind of remark uh, made about you because you're a woman, but I mean, I think everybody's subject to that. I've never felt really oppressed in any way. I don't think I've been held back in any way either. I don't think uh, I've ever not had uh, promotion in my job just because I was a female or anything like that at all. Their philosophy also means that Cynthia and Julie see their lesbianism as very much a private matter. And even here, relationships are coloured by the traditional heterosexual view of love. Well, again, that's due to my background, where the, the, um, the children would stay at home until they met someone they were going to marry, and then they'd marry and, uh, and live with that person for the rest of their lives. I mean, it was, uh, it was just the accepted norm, and I suppose I followed that pattern. I stayed at home, I met Cinny, I moved out and lived with Cinny. <laughs> um, yes. No, it never occurred to me to do anything different. And in my family background, um, it's always been the accepted thing that you meet someone, fall in love, and you stay with them for the rest of your life. Mm. And I think I grew up with that sort of romantic notion, which sounds a bit archaic and old-fashioned now, but uh, if that's the way you've, you've been brought up to think about relationships, mm. I think it's, uh, you know, it's difficult to see it in any other way. But in one way... Their acceptance of the label lesbian as setting them apart was to have a radicalising effect. The isolation they felt prompted them to group together with other lesbians for support. In the 60s, they founded the Minority Research Group, and then Kenrick, the first lesbian social club. 
These groups might not seem very radical today, but in the 1970s, their tradition of self-help was to converge with another, quite separate political development, the women's movement. These two coming together, lesbian politics and women's politics, were to produce a new generation of lesbians who were to mount a far more radical challenge to the sexologist's whole idea of what a lesbian is. The new generation of lesbians believed that they faced discrimination not just because they were lesbians, but because they were women. They came to this belief from different directions. Some were like Anne Tobin, who is a mature student. She became a feminist after bad experiences in organisations run by gay men. For instance, there was a theatre trip organised to which both men and women in, in equal numbers had signed up to go onto this theatre trip. And two of the men on the committee, off their own bat and without any discussion, arranged for a trip to a disco after the theatre. The only trouble was that this disco was a male-only disco, but that was all right because they'd asked permission for women to be allowed in that night and they really couldn't understand why we were so angry. And they did other things like um, there was a raffle that was organised and the prize was for a, two tickets to a gay male sauna and again they couldn't understand why the women were angry at that. And it had all sorts of things, I mean, prizes being offered were Shirley Bass's dress being offered for raffle or... Uh, I think one of the final straws was when one of the men asked one of the lesbians on the committee where did women do their cottaging. <laughs> they couldn't understand when we said women don't cottage. And I thought quite seriously after about nine months of this about just giving up on the whole thing altogether. I, I thought coming out as a lesbian would be a really big thing in my life and it would change it. And I was just regarded as as another sex object and everyone was just cruising around. And I, I thought quite seriously about becoming celibate and thinking, oh, I'll give up on the whole thing. Um, and there was this women's disco on, which involved quite a few people that I knew only slightly, but most of them weren't involved in the gay centre at all. And um, I thought, well, I'll give it one more try, and I really forced myself to go to this thing. I walked around town for about three hours, <laughs> thinking, how oh, shall I go, or oh, shall I? And I finally went and came into contact with lesbians who weren't in the gay scene at all, who were actually in the women's movement, and it was just a whole different thing that was going on, and I felt much happier with that. Julie Meller is one of the youngest of this new generation of lesbian feminists. She, too, began by getting involved in gay politics. I did identify very much then as gay, as opposed to lesbian, and with Shay, basically, and with male homosexuals. And I now identify as a lesbian, or as a dyke even, as a lesbian feminist and a dyke, which is a much stronger image as far as I'm concerned. Anne Bond came to lesbian feminism from the other direction. It was joining a university women's group that led her to identify herself as a lesbian. In that women's group were some lesbians who, it seemed to me, were very positive women. They were very strong women. I actually felt attracted to those women, probably physically as well as admiring them for, for their strength. Because lesbians like Anne and Julie believe that the whole social system oppresses them as women, they have a very different attitude from previous generations of lesbians. They no longer want to fit in. Instead, they see their whole lives as challenging society. This means most of them are not interested in succeeding in conventional careers. They prefer to devote their energies to collective work with other women, like the National Lesbian Conference they were involved in organising when we spoke to them. I came to the conference about Christmas and conference planning group with three designs for a poster for the conference. And one was chosen, and since then we've had 10,000 items of publicity printed for the lesbian conference, which we've made obviously quite a bit of money to run the conference out of. The fact that we're actually doing something and getting on with a lot is obviously a political challenge or a political statement in itself. Lesbian feminists like Anne and Julie are also against the idea of conducting relationships that simply parallel the heterosexual family. They want to work out new ways of living with groups of other women. I'm, again, like Julie, it's I'm a member of a women's housing co-op and I've chosen to live with women. I've chosen to challenge, through my lesbianism, I challenge the political norms of society in the sense of you live in a nuclear family or you live with a man. 
I want to challenge that. That's how I see my lesbianism as political. And I go to quite great lengths, in fact, to ensure that that political challenge is maintained in what I do and in the way I live, the way I carry out my relationships. Sometimes it's a hard process, but I think in the end it's a, it, it still remains a challenge and in the end I think it's a very positive thing to be able to do. That's how I see it as political. But most importantly, these women refuse to see their lesbianism as a purely sexual matter. For them, sex is just part of a much larger and more general commitment to women. We're basically emotional lesbians as opposed to our identification from society is seen as totally sexual, which it isn't. It's basically emotional attraction mm. and emotional strength and solidarity, which we have to have because we're, we're bas basically at war a lot of the time on the street just to survive, which I don't think is a position that is very fair on us because we're trying to just get on with our lives without being hassled. I think that's right. I mean, the emotional energy that goes with being a lesbian, the emotional energy that you put into other women, is certainly not a queer thing. I think it's, to me, very logical and very necessary because if women don't help other women, is what it boils down to, then nobody will. So, in a curious way, we seem to have come full circle. Once it was common for women to share intensely loving physical relationships, even though the sexual possibilities of their love were rarely recognised. Then the sexologists recognised the sexual potential and very little else. Lesbians became defined solely as sexual beings. Now, in its turn, that narrow definition is being overthrown by some lesbians who want to revive loving, caring relationships between women. Whether that entails sex is no longer the most important question. Passionate friendships, I think, as described in you know, letters and, and biographies of certain very prominent women, I think were very important as they stood, and I think um, in that people knew that women had very, very serious involvements with other women. I would like to see that kind of thing again, not necessarily a sexual relationship. I mean, I would like to have that recognition that women can be together like that, that women can be important in each other's lives. The main reason for me now for being a lesbian is not to go to bed with women. It's actually to talk and be friendly with and work with women in getting away from the domination that we suffer under as women. And that's the important thing. So I, I, in a way, I think I would explain lesbianism not so much as a sexual relationship with women, but as an emotional friendly relationship with women. And out of that emotional friendly relationship, then that becomes your whole life. Mm -hmm.